Welcome to Board Game Binge, the place where we bring you bite-sized, bingeable board game content from across the industry. I'm your host, James Staley, and in this episode, we're chatting with Jessica Cassidy, International Director of Marketing at Ion Game Design, Muddy Boards in Malta, as well as Ape Games in the USA. She's generated millions of dollars across various crowdfunding campaigns and is a game developer herself. Jess is also the host of Girls Stampede on Heavy Cardboard YouTube channel. She goes by the moniker of Board Game Girl Jess. Jess, welcome to The Binge. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. Well, it's great to have you on here. Uh, you've got <laughs> just an immense amount of experience across this entire industry. You're really kind of touching it uh, from many different angles. And I thought from our listeners, we would just start off by kind of getting into like, who were you before you even got into board games? Like, what was your background before you even got into this industry? So this is funny. It has nothing to do with board games, but I, um, I started working at a bank when I was like in high school because they had a bank in my high school. So I started there and I ended up uh, getting a job at a credit union and by sheer just volunteering for every job they ever needed somebody to do, I ended up being the manager of their online banking platform. And uh. it's a very large credit union, the third largest in North America. And I really helped them carve out this online banking platform on the internet. Um, before that, everything had been dial up. You know, this is kind of when the internet was getting into every home and we were switching from AOL to like real speed internet. That's old school. <laughs> yes. And so I kind of hit it at the right time and it took off. And what I found was I had a skill set that allowed me to really help people shine. And so I ended up um, building a department and, and having a lot of folks under me in my department. And these were the folks that were about to be uh, I, I, for lack of a better word, fired. Like they were the problem employees and HR would come to me and be like, all right, do you want to try? And I would take these folks on, I'd find their individual, like what made them shine. Mm -hmm. And I would help them kind of realize that within our department. And we did a tremendous job. Um, and so much so that when I left and it got taken over, people, the, the new manager would contact me and be like, how did you do all that you did? My employees are double what yours were and I can't get them to do it. But if you really value folks, I found and really help them do what they're good at, um, then you can really achieve a lot. And so that's kind of what I brought into board games is I'm super curious. I wanted to learn about everything that went into board games. And I also just really want to see people succeed. I want to see these designers that have these really unique ideas have an opportunity to bring them to the gamers who love these games. And so that's kind of where I fell in the marketing that I currently do is trying to help people shine in whatever they're doing with board games. So how did, um, how did you get into the actual industry itself? So you've got three companies now, and I think you also do consulting on the side as well, right? Yes. So how did that all kind of come together? Uh, through a long process. Uh, <laughs> what happened was I one day was waiting for my kids at some outdoor school that they were at, and I'm hanging out in a parking lot. And I decided to open up an Instagram account because um, it was kind of popular at the time. Sure. And I decided I was going to talk about board games. So that's how I became Board Game Girl Jess. I just picked a name on the fly and I started posting about the board games that I would play with my friends. And my background in school, I went to school for psychology and for English. And um, my writing uh, degree kind of helped with writing these pithy little kind of almost short stories about the games that I would play. So that took off on its own. And then I went to my first board game convention, which was PAX East out here in Boston. And I really fell in love with the hobby and the people that I met there. And I found this game called Tesla versus Edison. And I'm also a big nerd. I love Tesla. And the fact that there was a game that had this historical premise and, you know, talked about one of my favorite 
people in history Tesla, I was, I think I squealed probably when I saw it on the shelf. I was like, this is made for me. And so I had just played the game and done a short little review and the company Artana, who mm. uh, was publishing the game had funny enough that same day come out with Tesla versus Edison Duel, which was a two player version of the game and posted it on Kickstarter. And I was a super backer in Kickstarter. So I immediately backed it and was like, wow, this is meant to be. I just reviewed the other game and now they have a duel. This is awesome. And they reached out to me and were like, hey, you're really excited about our games. That's awesome. And we need help at Gen Con. Uh, are you interested? And I was like, yeah. And of course. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and I should preface, they reached out to like everyone who backed the game and was excited. Um, so this wasn't direct, direct to me, but so I wrote to them, called them, emailed them everything I could think of and was like, me, pick me, pick me. I want to go to Gen Con. <laughs> and um, they did. Wow. So I went to Gen Con and I followed the rules explicitly. They gave a list of rules. I read it multiple times. I showed up and I was ready to follow the rules. And one of the rules was not too many cooks in the kitchen that during setup, listen to the booth manager and kind of step back and don't try to take over. So I tried to do that. I swear I tried. And eventually I ended up just being like, okay, can I just help because this is taking a really long time and I think we could be done in 10 minutes. And so I ended up kind of putting a lot into getting things done, created a system for them of like, all right, let's just do this and get this done and set this up. Yeah. By the end of that first like two hours with uh, the CEO of Artana, he was like, all right, we're going to talk about a job after this. And <laughs> can you take over the booth? <laughs> so that was my first Gen Con. I got a job immediately after with them and started working with Artana. And they were a three-man show, right? So mm. it was the CEO, the designer, and me. So that's where it was like, okay, I need to learn everything about this. Uh, booth management, you know, marketing, sales, distribution. I had to jump in. And I loved it. I loved learning it all and doing it. It was overwhelming at times, yep. but it was so much fun. So I did just jump in, learn a bunch of stuff. And then they eventually sold the company to Genius Games. Um, and at that point, I was like, you know what? I'm ready to go off on my own and kind of do some freelance stuff. So that's how I decided. I was like, what do people need? What do these smaller publishers need to get their games out there? Yeah. And I felt like marketing was a thing that people needed, but couldn't really afford a full-time person to do. Um, because this is not big margins. People are going into board games to make millions, right? Like, no, no one's driving a uh, Ferrari. <laughs> It's not no, a board game, that's not, sure. it, it, if they are, it's not from the board game industry. No. So this is very, very, very small margins that they're making. And yeah. so I thought, well, what if I divide up my time and everybody kind of just pays for a piece of it? And then I'm able to do some of the things globally that will impact all of these publishers, but they only pay for some of the time. And then I, you know, divvy up time doing other things they need and kind of offered that to them. Um, so that's what I do now for several publishers. So where did Lovelace and Babbage kind of fit in there? Okay, so that one is a hilarious story. Scott Alms is the designer of Lovelace and Babbage. Yeah. And he had just released the Coaster Park game. Okay. And I had gotten it and I was, it was not his fault, like the the pieces didn't fit together very well. And there were some problems with the manufacturing of the game. So I was at a board game store and Scott Elms knows this story. So this is not any way I dig it, Scott. He's a good friend. <laughs> he, um, I was at a thing and I was like, oh, I was frustrated with the game. And I was like, geez, I really wish someone would help Scott Elms. Like, like he has these great ideas. I really wish someone would help him get like a good game out there. Yeah. That, like doesn't have any problems. <laughs> this is terrible. And I got a call from Scott and I totally saw, thought someone was punk, like pranking me. I was yeah. like, yeah, who is this? Like, this is not, this is not Scott Elms. Cause like, I literally had just said this. 
it was Scott. And he had heard from Daryl Andrews, who's a friend with my, of mine that I've uh, worked with, designer of Sagrada. Yep. And, we had him on the podcast, um, actually, uh, I think uh, two weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, he loved Daryl. Great guy. Loved yeah. him so much. So yeah. he um, had recommended me to Scott that if uh, Scott was, so he was coming for Artana to publish the game, but he was also looking for me um, to kind of take the lead with it. So I ended up taking this game, Lovely and Babbage, to the guys at uh, Artana, showing them the game, pitching, you know, how we should get involved with it. It had a lot of bits and pieces at that point, um, too much for a manufacturing standpoint. The price point was going to be too high. So we had to talk about how we could change it. And they were like, listen, we don't have time for this. Are you going to dev it? Like, are you going to be the developer? And I was like, sure. All right. So I dove into that head first as well. And I'm so lucky because of anyone to work with, um, to be the first time developing, to have that be Scott Alms that I was working with uh, as the designer was so, so damn lucky. He's amazing. He's so willing to help. So if you're like, listen, I'm get, I'm stuck here. Can you help with this? He will dive in and do whatever you need. Um, but he's also really willing to listen and take changes. Um, yeah, he is the epitome of the perfect designer to work with as far as a developer, I would say. So that was really lucky. What wasn't so lucky is this is a math game. That's what I was going to say, and like a pro you're doing, making like math programs, right? Like were you an engineering background or something? Like how did you come up (laughs) to balance a math programming game? And then it's also historically based. So to go back and make the history accurate for the theme, this is a lot of development work. I have to go and make sure that these people that, you know, your characters that you're playing are going to, um, to get influence actually existed in the same timeline as Lovelace and Babbage, right? Mm. And I have to make the theme work for this game. This, this was a lot of work. And um, yeah, so that was a huge challenge. It was nine months of development and I was going to every convention known to man that year. So I, everything that happened, I went to, and that was a kind of a running joke. I think, oh, it was a crazy amount of conventions that year. Um, and 40, I think 40 conventions, that's not including the local ones. So I was gone uh, every other week just at a convention, but that gave me a lot of time to play test as yeah. well. Um, so that's how Lovelace and Babbage happened. And it's still my baby. If you haven't had a chance to play it, I highly recommend. I love that game, how it came out. And, and how has that I, helped it inform like your, um, so now when you consult others, having developed a game yourself, did you find that was kind of almost opened up your insight on different angles you can come at to help others? I think it was kind of the reverse, actually. Okay. Um, having played so many games, uh, that gave me an insight into development. Uh, okay. Um, and often you'll hear me if you watch heavy cardboard, um, and I'm reviewing games on there, you'll hear me say, uh, I think, you know, talking about the development of a game or yeah. why something is the way it is. Um, so really what drove me to development was that experience in board games. And, um, definitely I think having developed a game that helps me really trust when a game is in front of me, I'm definitely not quick to say, oh, I think this is broken or why is this like this? Because I know what it takes for these games to get completed. Um, So I have a lot of trust into the way the game is designed, right? Um, Because I've seen that process and the play testing that goes into it. So you mentioned Girl Stampede on uh, on heavy cardboard. So you Talk to me about how you started this. So you, you know, there's lots of content out there. Yeah. Certainly somebody with the, your type of experience should obviously uh, get into content creation. So I think the industry is glad not to have obviously. you. No, it's we're glad not, to have definitely. you. Definitely. But, uh, but so what was the thinking behind that? Like where we come from on that one? So there was actually a lot of uh, 
talk online, you know, I'm on social media all the time and it, around board games and in board game social media, you would see people post and be like, I want to follow more marginalized folks um, yeah. creating content or doing things in the industry. How do I find them? And there was just seemed to be a lack of awareness that while obviously there are huge strides that still need to be made um, for diversity in board games, there are a lot of us here. And so I wanted to bring the focus to highlighting that to say, okay, no, there, I know a lot of women who are doing things in the industry and a lot of LGBTQ uh, folks that are doing things um, yeah. and, and, you know, not just content creation, but publishers, CEOs, designers, developers. Yeah. And I wanted to highlight that marketing folks. Um, so yeah, that was the impetus for that was to highlight that. And in that regard, and, and I, I mean, I completely agree. It is, it feels at least as a very uh, heavily male dominated industry, at least on what you see. It, I, yes. I think everybody loves playing games, right? Like when I go to my, uh, my meetup group, when COVID's finally over and I can go back to it, you know, the room is 50, 50, probably men and women. So I know that there's uh, and marginalized individuals. I, I know that they're there and they're a huge part of the industry, but representative on screen yeah. or in kind of content creation or that kind of forward facing, you don't see it as much. And so why do you think that is? I, uh, because it's, it's really hard to be forward facing um, yeah. and not necessarily just in this industry. I don't think it's a problem that's specific to, to just board game media, but being media is very difficult and being on a YouTube channel, it, you end up getting a lot of comments. And, yeah. uh, you know, if you follow the board game social media, you'll see these marginalized folks talking about, like they're trying to put content out there. And when you're creating this content, it's your baby. Like this is a raw space, right? Like, so you've created something you're really proud of it may not be perfect, but you're trying to create to get better. You put it out there and there will be people that just because you are a female or just because you are, uh, you know, LGBTQ or really, again, just because you're different than them will try to take you down a peg for that and attack you for that. And that's really frustrating and hard to get through at times. I mean, you can have thick skin for, I think, only so long. Um, so even the strongest of us, eventually that one comment really does take you down. And they say, you know, like you need nine positive comments to make up for that one yeah. negative, right? So it's not that there aren't folks out there cheerleading and saying, hey, great job. You did wonderful with that. Want to see more of it. There is, but that one comment has a huge impact. Um, and it really can dissuade people from continuing. I take breaks regularly just for my own uh, so mental health and well-being <laughs> yeah. and self-care because having that happen when you are putting your heart and soul into putting something out there, uh, it's really hurtful um, and, and you struggle with that. And I think people on the other side just don't realize that we're humans. We're not, you know, made of steel just because yeah. we're putting content out there and it, still hurts to be attacked. Um, and there's constructive feedback. I want constructive feedback. I want to hear how I can get better and have suggestions made, but there's a way to do that. And it's, you know, you don't have to tear down. Yeah. I think it's, um, I think creation in general, even like uh, board game design, right. And designers, and you go to some of these, I've you know, interviewed lots of people that have uh, gone to design nights or, or prototype nights where they're trying to get feedback. And there's always that one guy, <laughs> right. That has to just come with this negative attitude that is there to really just take people down versus really try yeah. to, to help. And uh, on the content side, I, it's a real time, right? Like for instance, with the uh, uh, girl stampede, I mean, you've got a feed live on screen. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, there's nothing stopping somebody from throwing a comment in there and yeah. that, that takes huge guts. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, for good for you to, uh, to be able to do that. And I think it is important to try to, to kind of take that step back. Right. Cause I think it's easy to kind of get immersed in it and it, 
literally becomes your world. And, you know, without taking that step back, it, you can take some things personally from people who don't even know you. Yes. Right. And it can't be personal if they don't know you. So, but it still can hurt. Right. So I think that's, yes. uh, it's amazing. I think that you're creating this for, uh, you know, for people to, uh, kind of have that voice. Um, I've got uh, a number of people in, in the lobby. I just uh, wanted to follow up. Mike Bruner had one question on uh, pitching to games and developers, publishers. What specifically about Scott made him the perfect designer to work with? Um, specifically, just the fact that he was willing to listen to feedback, yeah. to consider, you know, I would come back with some things and he would really take uh, my findings to heart. Um, and it's like he was malleable, right? Like the design was malleable. He was willing to look at it and make the changes that needed to be made from, you know, I mentioned when we first got the game from him, the prototype had so many pieces Mm -hmm. and that was going to be way too expensive to, to manufacture for the margins that we had. And, you know, he was willing to talk about that and he really will just look at something and try to create exactly what you're asking of him. So that right there, but then also that he just isn't, uh, you know, he's not sticking to something and saying, no, you can never, it has to be this way or it has to be that. He wants to honestly consider uh, the feedback that people have, uh, especially the developers. And that's, I'm not saying it's rare, but I mean, again, we just spoke about like, you're creating these things. This is your baby, right? And you're putting it out there. So it can be hard to take that constructive feedback um, and to look at it and say, this is how I should change things. So it was wonderful that he was so open to that. I think if you look at a lot of the kind of, for lack of a better word, leaders in the industry, um, I think what really what makes a lot of them stand apart, like the ones that are, you know, kind of at that next level is the attitude. They all have very, very positive, open, mm-hmm. um, sharing attitudes, right? Which yeah. I think is, uh, I know um, Chandler uh, Copenhaver from uh, CrowdOx calls it uh, co-opetition, right? They're there to kind of, we're all technically competitors, but we're all trying to help yeah. each other out. It's kind of strange. Julia Thompson as well, uh, giving a big shout out, um, talking about she's a math uh, school teacher, echoing a lot of sentiments you have. We need to see more representation in the industry. Yeah. Uh, and she actually mentioned about COVID. How have you seen COVID impact this industry? So from a publisher specifically, are you seeing them having to pivot? And if so, how so? I mean, hugely, because we just talked about conventions and conventions had many uses. Um, conventions are a huge marketing tool right? Because mm-hmm. you're getting your games out there in front of people. You can do targeted releases, releasing games at a convention, um, selling out of your games at the convention, posting about the convention. It's a huge amount of content that we don't have. Um, and then a huge amount of direct marketing and sales to folks who are clearly our target audience because they're attending a convention, right? And then they're mm-hmm. sharing it with their friends and their feeds. And So to not have that, that's a huge uh, change for marketing. Um, It's a huge change for sales because it takes away an avenue of direct sales that we had as publishers, right? That we could Mm -hmm. bring all these games. They're brand new hot off the presses. People can feel like they're getting them early. We're selling out, you know, all of that happening, um, you know, and I'll admit creates a sense of uh, fear of missing out, right? FOMO that you know, again, leads to people buying more copies. So that is a huge thing. The coverage of conventions by media walking around, talking about what games they think are the best games at that convention, you know, so you're getting into top, you know, whatever number lists and really just spreading the word that's not happening. Um, Folks are doing the best they can with virtual conventions, but that's a very different space. And there's been a huge learning curve in the past year about how do we best set up our space digitally, right? We've mastered how to set up our space in person at these conventions, how to work with the vendors there, how, you know, how to grab our Ikea furniture to use it a show and then get rid of it after. Like we mastered that. And now it's all virtual and everybody has a different platform and a different way of doing it. And we had to learn that over and over and over again. So that's an ever changing landscape. And I think it will continue to change. Um, I hope some of the virtual stuff will stick around for people 
who can't make it to in-person conventions, even post-COVID. Um, because I think that opens up, again, you know, we talk about accessibility. There's folks who have disabilities. That includes, you know, mar those folks are marginalized as well. Yeah. And bringing people um, into gaming that have disabilities and giving them an avenue, I think that's super important. And I think what we can take what we learned from COVID and going digital um, and having these virtual conventions to hopefully ensure that we're welcoming those folks into the hobby um, and into those experiences as well, because unfortunately they're often forgotten and you know that's it's truly not fair. So yeah. trying to make sure that we're we're bringing that to them and continuing that, I think will be a good change. So mm -hmm. I think that there's good and bad. Um, you know, we've had to change some things that we do, but hopefully some of those changes will have a big impact uh, for diversity and bringing people into gaming going forward. The one challenge I have with the online, and I don't think anybody across any industry, because all industries are, are, are dealing with this right now, uh, not just the board game industry, is when you, when you have a convention, you have the ability to what I call the aisle grab or the aisle stop, right? Where you can yes. really step in front of somebody and say, hey, hey, check this out over here. Have you seen this, right? And, you know, those are the kind of the best brand ambassadors, the ones that actually pull the people in, right? And aren't shy to kind of get out and interact with people. When you're in a virtual uh, space, a lot of it's pre-booked meetings and things yes. are set up ahead of time. You lose that entire um, vibe that comes from a convention, which is, you know, this yep. kind of... Uh, serendipitous uh, interactions with people. So finding that hidden gem or yeah. even the play testing, right? You talked about yeah. pitching games and, and going to play test events and all of that is having to move virtual. And that's been a huge learning curve trying to make that happen. Yeah. What's the next Kickstarter you have coming up? So I have two coming up. I have Post Human Saga um, is a game from Mighty Boards, and they're doing a big expansion for it called Their Journey Home. So mm. this brings in a lot of the feedback they got from their first expansion, The Resistance, was more player interaction and working together in this post-apocalyptic world. And so that's going to be the Journey Home expansion. I'm really excited about that. And that hits Kickstarter February 2nd, actually, 2 2 21. And then I also have Dawn on Titan from Ion Games is coming to Kickstarter in February as well. And that is just like it sounds, we get a space game and it's going to be a lower barrier to entry, takes less time than many of the uh, other Ion games. So I definitely suggest people check that out because uh, both are actually really fun to play and can be played remotely too, which I think is another consideration a lot of uh, folks are trying to make, like what things and how can we get these to play remote play uh, yeah. while people are uh, socially distancing, but yet are going to be super fun for when we can finally get back together again and get around a game table. Yeah. Tabletop simulators really filled in a lot of that gap. Um, Absolutely. But it still has the limits, right? You don't have the yes. same, my frustration I find most when I use tabletop is um, it's great that you have all the components. You can physically move things around like you would in a game, but kind of that bird's eye view, the human eye is amazing, right? When you look at a table, you see everything macro and then your eyes zoom in on something quick. We're on a screen. You actually have to physically do that in and out, which is a little bit. That is so that well put. Day. That is the issue, yeah. right? Cause you need to see what you need to see in the moment yeah. and you're kind of fumbling with it. There's that delay on tabletop simulator where you're like, okay, let's hit zoom and zoom in to see this. And yeah, so absolutely well put. So how do people follow uh, either of these new games or how do they get kind of a, a preview link into to them? And then also how do they uh, check out your, uh, your girl stampede uh, YouTube channel? Absolutely. So um, mighty boards at mighty boards uh, on Twitter uh, as well as mighty boards on Facebook and Instagram that will have all of your links and the preview link for um, the journey home is up so they can take a look there for that. And Dawn on Titan as well has a Kickstarter preview link and that will be at um, Ion Games on all social media uh, across all platforms as well. So they can take a look for, through there. They can find me um, at Board Game Girl. Uh, I think it, what is it? Board Game underscore Girl One on Twitter. <laughs> 
yeah. and Board Game Girl One on Instagram and Board Game Girl on Facebook as well. And then Girl Stampede has its own social media, so you can find at Girl Stamp at Girls underscore Stampede across uh, social media. And as far as YouTube, we actually go live off the Heavy Cardboard channel. So you can go subscribe at Heavy Cardboard um, on YouTube to get alerts about Girl Stampede episodes coming up. Jess, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on this podcast. I hope we can have you come back again. Maybe one of, one of these launches are coming up. We can get into the details of some of these games even deeper. We just awesome. want to wish you all the best to you and your family and have a happy new year. Thank you so much. You too. Take care. Cheers. This has been an episode of the Board Game Binge Podcast, hosted by James Staley, produced by James Staley and Mike Bruner, with original music by Nick Smith. If you would like to watch these interviews live, simply join the Facebook group Board Game Binge, and you'll get access to live interviews, giveaways, and interesting board game content from across the industry. I can't wait for you to join us. See you next time.